Dr. Clark here, and for Forest Management Lecture, um, we are going to talk about silviculture and harvesting, or harvesting methods, and the practice of silviculture. So, <clears throat> there's two pictures here, and one is showing, uh, or representing, I guess you could say, silviculture, which is the act or practice of uh, replanting or how should I say this uh, basically farming of trees and harvesting there's lots of different methods we'll come back to it clearly from most of you who know about harvesting trees or any forest management you could see that this is clear cutting um, where the land is completely clear and devoid of trees. We'll come back to uh, check out some of these other examples as we progress through the lecture. Okay, first I want to just talk about general kind of definitions like I always do and kind of give you that definition so you understand when I talk about civil culture or silvics um, or um, forest management, what does that mean? Okay, so civil culture is basically the art and science of tree production. So like I said, it's it's tree farming. Right? You're planting trees, you're cutting them down, and it is based on silvix. So what is silvix? Silvix is the science behind silviculture. Okay? And, and so the science behind silviculture is the study of the forest, its relationships, and that would be the plants that are there, not only the forest materials, not just the trees, but what about the grasses and the shrubs and the other plants that are on the um, landscape? What type of soil is it? And we're going to get to a lot of these different things. We'll talk about different types of plants. We'll talk about different types of soils. And then we'll spend a little bit of time with the animal interactions with these trees. Okay, so regardless of civil culture, okay, so again, this is tree production, but it's based on the science. It's based on the ecology of how does the forest work? How is, you know, everything interacted with each other? What's the soil type? What's, you know, what kind of harvest are you going to be able to have if you have large populations of small rodents that eat a lot of seeds or might eat your newly planted trees. What is, you know, what's that relationship? Where are the animals? That kind of stuff. Okay. So civil culture in general is manipulation of forced environments. Okay. And so just like we would talk about the prairies, and we talk about you know plowing up the grasslands and planting corn or sunflower or soybeans, whatever that might be. Civil culture is very similar in the sense that we're talking about cutting down native forests, manipulating the landscape. Maybe that's manipulation is that you burnt the landscape to remove all native seeds or native areas. And now you're manipulating it by planting trees that you're interested in. Okay. So, again, we'll come back and we'll look at specific examples, mainly specific examples that have to do with what are you going to plant on the landscape. Okay. And um, again, if you think of silviculture, you can think of it very sim similar to agriculture. And it's a, in fact, it's part of agriculture okay? in that you are manipulating a landscape, but you're manipulating a landscape for tree production rather than, you know, grain production or fruit production or something like that. Okay, so you can see here, this is, you know, fairly typical example of, you know, a civil culture practice. These are seedlings that have been planted. Um, in rows and uh, we'll come back to this but I, I briefly want to hint or touch on this 
what you plant on the landscape is the choice of the individual. So if we're in regions where it's a public owned entity, um, then the Forest Service is, is determining how it's been cut and what's going to be planted on the landscape. Often what gets planted back on the landscape is more heterogeneous. Heterogeneous meaning you have a higher diversity. You have a few different types of trees that are going to be planted. But if it's privately owned and it's basically in production for harvest, then you're not planting different types of trees. You're planting one type of tree. And often you want to select a type of tree that's been either genetically modified or so it's a GMO. And then the newest uh, type of organisms that are coming on the market soon uh, are CRISPR edited organisms or CRISPR Cas9 organisms, which means that their DNA has been edited in a different way. And I'll, I'll touch on what the difference between a GMO is and a CRISPR organism. Okay? But these are, these are choices that individuals are going to make when they replant a landscape. Okay, so again, how you go about silviculture. Are you preparing the land for new trees? Um, are you leaving what we call seed trees? So maybe you leave some trees so it replants the land naturally and you don't have um, seedlings being planted in the ground. Are you managing this uh, for weeds? So maybe you go through and... Um, you know, you have fire or maybe you go through and you spray herbicides. Maybe you go through and you spray insecticides or fertilizers. How you manipulate it is all part of that civil culture um, in, in regards to whatever you're managing. Okay. And then, of course, you know, it also depends on, you know, how much hands-on or how much management are are you going to, how much management are you going to apply to the landscape? So in other words, like, are you going to come in and you're going to cut out all the species that are not wanted? Because you're still going to get, even in a, you know, a civil culture area where you manipulated the land to a certain species and you only planted that certain species, you're still probably going to have to have some management where you might be coming in and cutting out the quaking aspens out of a pine forest because the aspens, um, for those of you who don't know much about quaking aspens, is they send out runners. So all it takes is like one aspen tree and the entire region, I we might say a few hundred yards to even possibly, um, you know, 50, 60 acres in certain, in certain areas uh, can be one species or one individual. Okay, so one aspen tree that just sends out runners and it pops up clones of itself. Okay? And so you can have in a whole aspen stand that's you know coming into a region where maybe you're interested in you know harvesting pines and you get all these aspen that are popping up okay and you you can't control them that easily because they they can clone themselves and they they establish themselves via runners so you come in and you might remove some of those large aspen trees that might be shading out some of the pines um, or you might remove all the aspen trees. You know, there's lots of ways at which you can manipulate the forest. How much manipulation or how much management depends on what the outcome of the forest should be. If this is forest service land or public land, then most likely you're only removing aspens if they're diseased, or you're only removing trees if they're diseased, or for fire purposes, fire prevention, that kind of thing you might re be removing. If there's a large stand of dead trees, you might be removing some of those 
um, because of the fire hazard that they might, you know, might present in 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 the future. Okay, so civil culture is a mixture, and so we talked about the civics. Okay, that's basically ecology, but civil culture is more than that. Okay, so the ecology, if like I said before in previous lectures, if all decisions were based purely on science then there would be no arguments there would be no fights there would be no there would be no polls there would be no town meetings there would be no real discussion it would be based purely on ecology okay what's best for the landscape okay? and we know what is best for a landscape okay the problem is what's best for the landscape is often not going to create any economics. So there's no money in leaving a landscape alone and letting the ecology take place. Okay? And society wants both. Okay? So there are some people that have no ties to maybe a economic base. They want the ecology. They want material to be left alone. Okay? So maybe these are individuals that are interested in, in you know watching birds or walking on trails hiking through forested habitat these kind of things they pr probably have no connection to the economics and so they they value the ecology more you might have the opposite side though you might have someone that you know has a history of logging in their family um and you know that's their economics. That's that's how they make their money is by cutting trees, harvesting wood, or you know making products from those wood products. So the economics is very important for that group, and that's where society comes in, and that's really where civil culture comes in, where you have to balance or attempt to at least balance the ecology, the economics, and society's views. Okay, so. How, what role does civil culture play? Well, um, civil culture, again, is that manipulation of the land and then forest production. Okay? So it's basically farming, but your farm is not annual. So most farms are kind of an annual thing where you plant seeds in really early spring okay, and fall, you harvest your crop most farms are kind of like that now orchards are a little bit different you might plant trees and then you harvest crop um every fall maybe sometimes spring sometimes in the summer depending on the you know the species of fruit that you're interested in in the case of tree farms or civil culture you plant and how you plant might be seedlings it might be natural seeding there's lots of different ways you plant then you manage, you manage by clearing. So often you'll have to go in and you'll have to clear out. So the trees are spaced a, you know, a good amount of space away from each other. So there's less competition. Even when you're planting in, in rows okay, and you're actually building a tree farm, still sometimes this manipulation has to happen. Okay? On part from you know also in regards to that manipulation it might be that you have to prune some trees okay thin the trees you might have to manipulate the soil by you know uh, supplying nutrients to the soil you might manipulate the the landscape by spraying herbicides insecticides prescribed burns there's there can be a lot of work in creating a very uniform stand that can be cut 30 years down the road that's where the big i guess the big point of view comes in with civil culture is you're prepping a plot of land today that you won't be able to cut for another 30 years okay? and that's where a lot of these early manipulations can increase the yield at that 30-year mark by a great deal. 
Okay, if you have, you know, excellent spacing, so you have less competition, then you'll get more trees off the landscape, um, you know, 30 years down the road. If you have a lot of survivors, the young trees um, are all surviving because, you know, you, you're keeping out deer and elk and you're keeping out things that might consume the, the seedlings, right? um, then your end harvest is going to be greater. Right? So a lot of early work in civiculture will be at this stage, not much at the 16, 20, 25 year stage, even 12 year stage. That region, maybe a little bit on prescribed burns, right? just to make sure that if a forest fire breaks out that you don't lose the entire stand of forest. And then again, when it comes into logging or taking the trees off the landscape, that you know that period of 30 to 40 year kind of period is when you're going to kind of cut. And again, it really depends on the species of tree. Now we have some trees, some poplar species that they're ready to cut in 10 to 15 years. We have some old growth trees that we're cutting down that are 150, 200 years old. Okay? So the time period is different. Okay? But again, that's kind of the role that silviculture plays is this kind of cycle of plants or cycle of whatever is going to be harvested. In this case, cycle of trees and the different types of trees. Okay, so there's a couple rules when it comes to silvicultural systems, and one that's often stated and often um, driven into the minds of individuals who might be going into forest management and, and have that silviculture uh, background is that a plan is, is probably the most important part, okay? So when you're talking about forest management, you have to determine the civil culture system. So how are you going to manage your land? Okay. Is this public land? If it's public land, you're gonna manage it very different than private land. If it's public land, you're going to have to decide, well, are we going to replant the forest after it's harvested? Or are we going to have the forest come back naturally? Now, different regions will have different management plans. And, that, and in fact, different sides of a mountain might have different management plans. Okay? If you're on a you know, south-facing slope okay, and you get a lot of sun, so maybe you're in the northern hemisphere and you get a lot of sun in the south-facing slope, then harvesting more trees might be okay because you know maybe it gets enough sun and the tree the growth rate is good but what if you're in a region where there's very little water then harvesting very few trees on the south facing slope is probably more important because you need to retain as much water as possible so if you have snow but you have very little water then you know that management system is very different. Then you flip over to the north side slope, okay? Less sunlight, typically holds on to moisture a lot easier, okay? But you might be able to cut a lot more trees there, but you might have to wait uh, a longer period of time because the growth rate of the trees, because they get less sun, might be slower, okay? So by having the system, okay, what are you going to do? How are you going to manipulate the land? How are you going to ma manipulate planting? What type of harvesting are you going to have? Um, are you going to prune? Are you going to, you know, select for a certain species? The system is important. Right? And basically it starts with that circle of life. Okay, so you figure out what tree species you're interested in, and it might be a variety of tree species, okay? and then you look at their life cycles. How long does it take for them to reach, you know, a certain diameter of breast height? 
what's your seed germination? Right? If you're going to have natural seeding, how many seeds are going to fail? Right? So what's the over germination rate? Um, if you're going to plant, okay, how many are going to survive that year one, year two? Okay? How many are going to, you know, how, how much of the landscape might you have to replant? Because, you know, you might have areas where it's arid and so like, the, you know, the top of a hill or something like that, where it's not getting as much water. Maybe the growth rate's poor there. So there's all kinds to, of things to think about. But having a good plan, and, and I can't emphasize this enough, a good plan that examines many aspects of the early life of that forest is really key. Because if you plant it, and instead of being able to harvest it, 30 years down the road, but because of the way that you planted it or the way that you manipulated the land, you can't harvest it until 60 years down the road. You just doubled your time for harvesting. Okay? And when you're talking about something that has that long of a maturation period, you're probably planting it. You're probably coming up with a management plan but you might not even be around for the harvesting, okay? And that's where that management plan is very, very important, okay? So let's look at some ways at which we can manipulate the landscape and things that we need to think about when it comes to harvesting and potential of replanting, okay? So harvesting, let's say we use this method, okay? This is a clear cutting method. This was used a lot and still is used a lot in other countries. On private land, clear cutting is, is, is used all the time. Right? And in fact, it's probably the only method that's used on private land if that private land was, is going to be replanted and harvested again. Because you want to clear the entire area and start over, replant, okay? and have all your trees uniform size, so everything is uniform. If you're clear cutting public land, it's very different, okay? Um, because a lot of forest management on public land and the ecology suggests that you shouldn't have stands, you shouldn't have trees all the exact same size, okay? That's not good ecology. That's not how a natural forest works. So by manipulating and making every tree the same species and same size, okay, you manipulate a forest going against what ecology would suggest you do. Okay? So there's kind of two pieces there. So clear cutting has its benefits. Obviously, you can get a lot of material. You can get big rigs. You can cut this material this area down much quicker than many of the other other methods, but it has its downfalls too. Right? You have this big area that has is devoid of vegetation, devoid of at least trees. Okay, so snow melt runoff is going to be heavy here. You're going to lose a lot of nutrients because of that. Often um, in regions where you might have heavy rains and things like that. A lot of the, the nutrients might be pouring off the landscape. And then if you replant either naturally um, by allowing these trees on the edges to reseed this, that could take a very long time. Okay? Or artificially by sticking trees actually in the ground, um, that's quicker. But again, you're going to have a uniform forest. You're going to have trees that are all the same size, which there are benefits too. It's easy to harvest. It's easy to know when to harvest. Okay, but there are costs to that. Okay, a fire breaks out, um, and every tree is uniform. That crown fire can rip through the entire forest very easily, and there's no break. Um, there's no, you know, separate type of species of trees. So if everything burns the same rate, then you're you're in trouble. 
The other thing can happen is if everything's uniform, uniform age, and you have a disease outbreak, everything dies. You have an insect infestation, everything dies because they're all uniform. There's, there's very little genetic diversity, so everything dies in that region. So again, benefits and costs, but these have to be in a manager's mind when you're setting up that civic culture plan. Okay, so here's another example. This is called the seed tree example. So the seed tree example means that you're going through and you're cutting the majority of the trees in a, in a given region, okay? but you leave in, in actual like calculated spots, you're leaving what we call a seed tree. And when I mean calculated spots, managers that do this well We'll find out, okay, so what is the radius around the tree in which seeds are often deposited? And so they might do this by looking at seed counts. So you, you might select a different region or select a species of tree, and you look at seed counts, and you look at the density of seeds around these trees. Then you find out what the radius is around each tree that you need. And then you can come through and you can mark trees at a given distance away from each other. So you can get uniform seeding that happens across your landscape. Now, you're not gonna have uniform germination. So your trees aren't gonna all be the same size because you might have some trees you know, in certain regions germinating year one, some trees, seedlings germinating year two. And so you're gonna have different size forests or for, different size sections of this forest, but nonetheless, um, it's all naturally seeding. Okay? Natural seeding is the cheapest seeding, okay? but remember the old saying, time is money. Let's say it takes 15 years for this to be completely seeded and to have a good amount of growth. Plus you don't know how close the trees are going to be growing to next to each other. So, you know, naturally seeding, obviously you don't have to spend any money to apply, apply seeds in there, but you might have to spend more money to come in and prune. You might have to spend more money to come in um, and, uh, harvest in a certain way maybe the trees are too tight you might have to harvest early um, but the big one is naturally seeded landscapes often take longer than if you're just sticking trees in the ground much longer so time is money so maybe you can't cut this in 30 years because it takes 10 years to reseed naturally so maybe you're out 40 years okay so again it's kind of like clear cutting because you're cutting the majority of the trees and you're just leaving some of the big ones that you know seem to be good seed producers and they will reseed the landscape. Okay. Often you then go in once you got you know a good amount of trees that are reseeded and germinated, then you come in and you cut these seed trees down so they're not competing against trees you know, um, that they receded. Okay, so these little seedlings that would be underneath these trees. Um, you don't want the competition, otherwise it even takes longer for that region to reach maturity. Okay, <clears throat> one more, this is shelter wood. Okay, and shelter wood can look um, very different from what's, you know, given here, but again, uh, maybe you're only harvesting half the trees in a given region. Okay? So you leave bands of trees. So you might um, harvest a band, leave a band, harvest a band, leave a band, etc. Or you might go through and you just thin out the region. So you still have quite a few trees, maybe half the trees left on the landscape. And you're just going through kind of picking random trees to cut down. Now, there are problems to this kind of harvesting. Clearly, most of you can probably think problem. It's very difficult to get machinery in here. So you want to do this, you know, 
with machines and do it quickly, that's not going to happen. Okay? So instead, what you're doing is you're often doing this by an individual, you know, coming in, saw cutting, and then the trees are dragged out of the landscape, okay? or, um, you know, maybe you have a, a two road system, maybe a top road and a bottom road. And, and, you know, so you limit the amount of destruction to the ecosystem by far. Okay? You leave a lot of shelter wood, you leave a lot of habitat for organisms. Okay? These are all potential seed trees. So you're probably not going to replant this artificially. You're going to have it naturally recede. This is a method that's often used on public lands. Okay? So you harvest out material, okay? but you leave material on the landscape for you know, ungulates, for deer and elk. Um, you're leaving it for the birds. You're leaving it for the small rodents and things like that. Um, the other thing is, is once the trees that, you know, start coming back, the, the young trees, the saplings start coming back, then you can come in and you might remove all the shelter wood. Okay. So, um, as to not compete against those young trees. Okay. So there's a lot of different methods. Um, there's benefits to them all and there's cost to them all. Okay. And we're just going to present it. Um, so as a manager, you need to know which one's right for the ecosystem, which one's right for the region in which you're managing. Okay. Single tree selection is another method. Okay, so where you're going in and you're selecting just single trees, maybe you're selecting high quality trees. So a lot, a lot of single tree selection might happen where you're selecting trees that are worth a lot of money. So maybe you're selecting trees for furniture. Okay, so you're going in and you're selecting black walnut, or maybe you're selecting, you know, uh, a type of cypress tree or a type of cedar that might be used for some kind of furniture, ma furniture making. Um, so you're selecting a single tree. Okay? The other thing that single tree is good for is um, single tree can also occur in regions that have an old growth ecosystem. Okay? So some of the really old forests in Canada especially on Native American land, are cut out or single tree selection. And you might say, well, how do you get the tree out? I mean, you're going to have to drag it a long ways in between trees. Nope. It's done by helicopters. All right, so you go in, you hook a helicopter strap onto the tree, a chain onto the tree, the tree's cut. The helicopter drags off a single tree at a time. Okay? Very expensive, but the habitat is pristine. Okay, you're just removing large trees off the habitat. Okay, and some of those old old growth trees, you know, they're they're worth you know thousands upon thousands of dollars. Okay, sometimes tens of thousand dollars, depending on the species of tree. So it's easily, easily worth, you know, coming in, hooking a helicopter up and, and taking that tree out okay, versus cutting the entire landscape, especially on uh, regions where, you know, that landscape might be protected. Okay? The other method is to do a group selection. Okay? Group selection um, can also be helicopter lifted off, but it can it can be lifted off or taken out by machinery okay, where you're just selecting a pod or a cer certain radius. You're going to cut all the trees in that radius and then you're going to move to a different, <clears throat> excuse me, a different radius, cut those trees and go on and on and on. So you make these little patches, which is often, you know, kind of mimicking or um, manipulating the ecosystem in a natural way. Often in ecosystems, 
uh, these trees in this region might all die because maybe there's an insect invest infestation or a disease outbreak. And all these trees in this one region all die. Okay? And then they all fall down because maybe they're just basically all part of that parent tree. So all these trees are, you know, same parent tree, same genetics. They can't withstand that insect infestation or the disease. They all die. Okay. And, you know, maybe you got some others over here. They all die. Then that region gets reestablished by new seeds. Okay. And that's pretty natural. Same thing with the single tree selection is pretty natural. Often we'll have a tree get struck by lightning, okay, or just die. It'll fall down. It leaves an open space. New trees can come in. So both these methods are often used in old growth forests um, or protected lands to kind of still remove some vegetation from the landscape, but make it so that landscape is act, acting as natural as possible. Okay, so if we talk a little bit about that benefit cost, and we I kind of hinted on this, but when you clear cut a forest, um, or even sometimes when you leave seed trees and shelter wood, okay, that forest becomes a uniform age, or what we often call one age class. There are benefits to that, and I already discussed that. If everything's the exact same age, then 30 years down the road, you can cut them all down and you can start over again. Okay. The problem is, is if everything is reaching maturity at the same time, everything's the same height, okay, um, you can have problems again with disease, fire, um, you know, insect infestations, those kind of things um, can really wreak havoc on older trees or uniform trees. Okay. <clears throat> when we use the method like a single tree cut or even a group tree cut, you get uneven age forests. Okay? So your stands are different ages. Um, different ages, again, there's benefits and costs. For the ecology, this is great. An uneven aged system is excellent for the ecology of a forest. You have certain birds, certain small mammals that like younger trees. Right? You have other birds, small mammals that like the older trees. You, you know, you can really have this understory that has some vegetation to it, so you can have ungulates and other organisms that might be in need of shelter to, you know, to shelter up in some of these smaller areas. A two-age system, okay, again, you know, this might be where you have a shelter wood cut and you leave the shelter wood, okay, or you have a seed tree cut and you leave the seed tree, where you only have two ages, but still, um, you know, at least you at least you don't have a single age system. From an ecology point of view, a single age system is the worst system you can have. Okay? The more ages, and quite frankly, the more variety of tree species you have, the better the ecology in that system is probably going to be. Okay? So <clears throat> with that being said, the next lecture we're going to look at seed types or basically how you go about replanting a forest okay so we talked about how the different ways at which you can harvest a forest and i'll talk more about you know actual actually having different cutting methods and things like that i'll talk more about that as we progress and i'll, I'll show you some um, clips of different cutting methods and things like that but whether you choose to clear cut, tree, or seed tree cut, shelter wood cut, okay, that's going to be in your management plan. Next, we're going to talk about 
you know, how are you going to reseed the environment? Are you going to use artificial seeds? Are you going to use natural seeding? What's the benefits? What's the cost? And then what are the different types of artificial seeding um, mechanisms? Like how do you get your seeds? All right. So next time, that's what we're going to